actionfigureresource.com. Yesterday's toys, today's treasures. Transformers rivals Star Wars in terms of sheer mind-boggling amount of toys produced and media created to sell these toys. To that end, this report will be focusing on the time period between 1984 and 1991, known to fans as Generation 1. It began as a joint venture between Japanese toy company Takara, which is Tomy in English, and American giants Hasbro. The idea which had previously brought Hasbro success with their new G.I. Joe line and what became the standard to which toys became sold from that point on was to create an animated series and spin-off comic full of bright, colourful characters locked in eternal warfare. The kids would then go out and buy the toys of their favourite characters and be forever on the lookout for new bots to add to their collection. Watch the original cartoon closely and note how often the characters refer to one another by name, the repetition ensuring recognition within the Isles of Toys R Us. The first few waves almost universally used moulds from two lines that Takara had already established in their native Japan, Microman from 1974 and Diaclone from 1980. Microman had already been imported to the USA by the Mego Corporation as Micronauts. After Mego folded in 82, Hasbro bought the rights to both lines for distribution in the USA, although in return, Takara retained the rights to distribute in Japan. Jim Shooter wrote the overarching story of the ongoing warfare between the Autobots and Decepticons. Fans will be familiar with how the design of the vehicular form of each character always took precedence over the bot form in the first few waves. It was editor Bob Budiansky's task over one long weekend to humanize these characters, revising profiles initially written by Marvel and DC comic writer Dennis O'Neill. Pudiansky later went on to write the tie-in comic and character profiles included with the toys. Hasbro then commissioned Sunbow to produce the tie-in cartoon series that became the first season. In Japan, it was named Fight Super Robot Lifeform Transformers, and the toys were redesigned, simplified, and further humanized to create the chunky, approachable characters that proved to be such a hit on screen. On a personal note, Peter Cullen's performance as Optimus Prime was what swung it for me. Rather than playing it as a bellowing, gung-ho military stereotype like most of his competitors for the role, he based his quiet, grave, and inspiring leader on his own brother Larry, who had served in Vietnam. Always seeking an alternative to combat until given no choice, at which point he is an unparalleled warrior, exemplified in this serious vocal approach as well as deed, made the character instantly iconic, up there with Kevin Conroy's Batman. Megatron has beaten me according to Cybertron law. To violate that law would destroy our honor. We will comply and leave this earth forever. As you command, Octopus. Opposite Cullen was the great Frank Welker as Megatron, as well as Soundwave and various other bots. Megatron being characterized as a gun made perfect sense. His only thoughts are to oppress and to destroy that which defies him. Up against an earnest, hard-working American truck, this made for an effective conflict dynamic. In toy form, Megatron was based on a Walther PP-8 with attachable barrel extensions, as well as a stock and a scope. 
This was clearly inspired by the gun used by Napoleon Solo in the 1965 TV show The Man From UNCLE, one that had already received its own toy. The Transformers model came from the Microman toy line and is understandably banned on planes in the USA. You even need a special license to own it in Australia. Since Generation 1, Megatron has been characterized as a tank and a jet rather than go through the difficulties of marketing a realistic looking firearm. The irony being, if he was an unrealistic looking space age ray gun, it's not much of a disguise. But this time I shall not be denied. This device will enable me to strike at the Autobots through Optimus Prime's only weakness. His overdeveloped sense of honor. <laughs> the show started with a three episode mini series in which we got introduced to the following Autobots Hound, Jazz, Mirage, Sunstreaker, and Wheeljack. All were based on Diaclone designs. Prowl, Blue Streak, and later Smokescreen are all based on the same Diaclone car model. Ratchet and Ironhide, likewise, are repaints of the same van, which bore little to no resemblance to their cartoon counterparts, seemingly missing heads. This was because the Diaclone line came with inch-high tiny men to pilot them, and Ironhide was thus more of a mech suit. Trailbreaker was later remoulded as Hoist, Sideswipe as Red Alert. There were also a number of mini-bots for kids with slightly lower budgets, in the form of Bumblebee, Cliffjumper, Gears, Huffer, and Windcharger. These were all based on designs from the Microman toy line. Again. Meanwhile, Megatron had his own army which included three virtually identical Diaclone planes with different colour schemes. Starscream, Skywarp and Thundercracker. Soundwave, the cassette recorder and his spies Laserbeak, Ravage and Rumble were all originally from the Microman line. Or more specifically, the Micro Change line, all of which transformed into household objects. <laughs> After the initial mini series, five Dinobots were created Slag, Sludge, and Grimlock, and later Snarl and Swoop. Soundwave got another cassette named Frenzy. The Insecticons, Shrapnel, Bombshell, and Kickback, and the Constructicons, Scrapper, Hook, Mixmaster, Longhaul, Bonecrusher, and Scavenger, joined the ranks of despicable robot evil. All of the above based on Diaclone toys, and the latter group able to combine a la Voltron to form Devastator. Hasbro were at this point developing their own new Transformers, but the lead times on creating new toys are far longer than remarketing old ones. As a result, there was a lot of frantic scrabbling for new prospective bots that existed outside the already exhausted Diaclone and Microman lines. There was Shockwave, who stayed behind to guard Cybertron for the four million years that the two factions are away. During this time, nothing seems to happen, which always struck me as odd. This was one of the first figures not to be derived from Diaclone or Microman. Instead, the Astro Magnum model, imbued with an unfortunately placed groinal trigger, was bought by Hasbro from a company named Toyco. Two more models were utilized from a company called Toy Box, Skylynx and Omega Supreme. Reflector was a camera that divided into three bots and only available from Hasbro via mail order. 
an enormous plane named Jetfire was rendered in toy form based on the designs of the Valkyrie in the Macross series. However, this was made by a company named Takatoku, who were brought out by Bandai, Takara's chief rivals in the toy market. This meant that while Hasbro could market it within America and Europe, Takara could not do the same in Japan, as Bandai were relaunching the Macross line. The design was altered for the TV show and renamed Skyfire, and US production ceased soon after to prevent further copyright dispute. More short-lived models mined from Takatoku included Roadbuster, Whirl, and the Deluxe Insecticons. Season 2 of the cartoon began in 1985 and, with its additional 49 episodes, brought it up to syndication numbers. The ongoing storyline was put aside in favour of self-contained character-based episodes. A whole swathe of new bots were brought in, with no fanfare or explanation. They were just there. The last Diaclone cards appeared as Trax, Skids and the basically identical Inferno and Grapple. Perceptor, the microscope, and Blaster, the boombox, came from the same micro-change transforming household objects line that Soundwave did, along with Blaster's cassettes, Steeljaw, Ramhorn, Eject, and Rewind. More mini Autobots included Beachcomber, Cosmos, Powerglide, Sea Spray, and Warpath. Decepticons received the first triple changes, which again were, as you might guess, originally Diaclone, in the form of Blitzwing and Astro Train. A final Diaclone line, cancelled in favour of simply making them Transformers, consisted of the combining sets of Stunticons, Combaticons, Aerial Bots, and Protector Bots. The Starscream model was used a further three times for Dirge, Ramjet, and Thrust. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. A big change came in 1986 with the release of the movie. Set in the far-off futuristic year of 2005, it dealt with a new generation of bots. Basically, this was a way for Hasbro to jettison the Diaclone models and refocus the toy line on original designs. This film is thus a bloodbath, seeing Prowl, Ironhide, Ratchet, Brawn, Wheeljack, Windcharger, Huffer, Skywarp, Thundercracker, Shrapnel, Kickback, Bombshell, Starscream, and even Megatron obliterated before our eyes. The most significant, memorable, and for many traumatic death being that of Optimus Prime himself. Prime, you can't die! Do not grieve. Soon, I shall be one with the Matrix. But soon, a new Autobot leader will arrive, introducing Rodimus Prime. No one can take on the Decepticons like Rodimus Prime. Transformers! The Transformers eat sold separately from Hasbro. In their place, Ultra Magnus utilized the Diaclone-powered Convoy model, the cab of which originally embodied Optimus Prime. Other brand new designs, all modeled on the kind of futuristic cars we'll be driving in 2005, include Hot Rod, and his leader upgrade Rodimus Prime, Cup, Blur, Springer the Triple Changer, and Minibot Wheelie. The movie also featured the first ever female Autobot in the form of RC, 
But she never got a toy because as we all know, according to marketers, boys don't want to buy action figures of girls. And girls don't want to buy boys action figures. Which raises the question, why was RC even there? Back on Cybertron, the Autobots have created three new warriors. Cup, experienced in battle. Blur, he's fast. Hot Rod, he really lives up to his name. The Decepticons' days are numbered. Robots in disguise from Hasbro. Megatron, Skywarp, and Thundercracker were Decepticons reforged by Unicron in the film to form Galvatron, Cyclonus, and Scourge. At this point, what seemed like a really good idea for disengaging the line with its Japanese roots, mostly based on realistically rendered cars and planes, and proceeding forth with neon-coloured space cars was the beginning of the end for many fans. Season 3 of the cartoon was less popular and it seemed like people missed the old characters, to this end, Optimus Prime was resurrected for the season finale. This third season of the cartoon featured all the new toys Hasbro had created. Broadside, Sandstorm, Computron, Metroplex, The Throttlebots, Predaking, Runamuck, Runabout, Octane, The Terracons, Trypticon, Slugfest, and Overkill. Aptly named. After these came the Target Masters and the Headmasters, which were the subject of a short-lived miniseries that constituted Season 4 in the West. Japan made its own entirely different episodes. Got to find them, but they're helping him defeat the Decepticons. Look, it's the Headmaster Autobots. Incredible! Yes, the driver of the vehicle actually becomes the head of the robot. Headmaster Transformers, more much more yeah. Headmaster Autobot displays a readout of its power. Nothing's better than going to battle with Headmaster Transformers, sold separately from Hasbro. In 1988, a fifth season was aired, consisting of re-released early episodes and the movie cut into five portions. This was to promote Power Master Optimus Prime, Hasbro's original take on the Diaclone classic Convoy. In a bizarre move to create links between the shows and sell the new toy, a giant early CG Optimus Prime told the story of the Transformers to a chirpy little boy with a mullet named Tommy Kennedy. Prime, I don't have much time today. I'm working on a special project for school. What's it about? Prime, just tell me how you and the other Autobots got to Earth. Okay, Tommy. I've handled enough emergencies to know that some things just can't wait. The Transformers first lived on the planet Cybertron. Prime, tell me something I don't know. Well, did you know that centuries of war had drained our planet of its precious energy resources? Whoa, looks like old Cybertron was ready for the scrap heap. Yes, it was. And the Autobots and Decepticons were on the verge of extinction. This represented the close of Generation 1. The decline in interest was most likely linked to the number of similar toy and cartoon combos that emerged in the 80s, competing for the children's attention. Thundercats in 1985, Ghostbusters in 1986, and The Big Kahuna in 1987, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which you can see more about in our dedicated video. Once Turtle Power hit, the bots just couldn't cut it. Toys continued to be produced and sold in decent numbers, but it would not be until 2007's live-action movie that they enjoyed the same intense success as they had in the mid-80s. In the interim 19 years, there was Generation 2 in 1993, which was just re-edited episodes of the first series with shonky CG and sound effects added accompanying recolored, garish re-releases of the initial line. Beast Wars in 1996, Beast Machines in 1999, and in 2001 a deluge of bots in the form of Robots in Disguise, Armada, Energon, and Cybertron. However, most fans over 25 years old, even those who can appreciate some of the above, seem to agree that the core roots and characters of Generation 1 are what define the almighty franchise. Having said that, the Michael Bay movies have proved massively influential on the toys, video games, and new TV shows. 
so what we're likely to see recurring most in the future is a blending of these two eras. ActionFigureResource.com Yesterday's Toys, Today's Treasures.